Greetings. Welcome to the last lecture on noise. I am Bezal Razavi. Today we will uh, talk about uh, some principles of low noise design. Uh, this is just an introduction because low noise design, especially in different fields, uh, ass assumes a very wide range of topics and uh, in 30 minutes we can't really cover all of those. So, but we just want to have a feel for how we go about designing a low noise circuits in general. So, uh, we will uh, talk about low noise op amps as one example of how our understanding from previous lectures helps us minimize the design of uh, the noise of a, an op amp. And then we talk about uh, K2 over C noise as another important noise component that we encounter in many applications. And then uh, we'll see one application example of how, uh, how all of these ideas come together. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's just uh, briefly review what we covered in previous lectures uh, to make sure that uh, we have all the tools necessary today. Uh, we saw that uh, for a common source stage with a current source load, the input referred thermal noise is given by 4kT gamma over GM1, which is the gate referred noise voltage of M1. M1 is in the signal path, uh, plus 4kT gamma GM2 over GM1 squared. 4kT gamma GM2 is the noise current produced by M2. M2 is a constant current source, so it just gets divided by GM1 squared as it gets referred to the input as a voltage. And uh, what we do know is that GM, for example, has this dependence upon the bias current and the overdrive voltage. So this tells us that to minimize the input referred noise of the circuit, we have to maximize GM1, which means either minimize the overdrive voltage or maximize the bias current. And then to minimize the noise of M2, we have to minimize this GM2. And for a given current, it means we have to maximize its overdrive voltage, which means we are really maximizing the allowable VDS for M2. So as M2 is designed to contribute less noise, it will also occupy a greater amount of voltage headroom, leaving less headroom for voltage swings at the output. And that is the principal drawback of the circuit. Okay, we also talked about the cascode structure, and we saw that the primary source of noise uh, are M1 and RD, and the noise of a cascode device is generally negligible in a good design, especially at moderate frequencies. If you go to very, very high frequencies, then the capacitance here has to be considered. But for most applications, the noise of the cascode device should be negligible because the voltage gain from here to this gate referred noise to the output is very small. Definitely smaller than the gain from here to here. <clears throat> okay, and lastly, we saw how to analyze the noise performance of a differential circuit. We said that we simply find the noise of half of the circuit, uh, for example, the input different noise, and then we double that noise spectrum. So, for example, the thermal noise gets a goes up by a factor of 2, and the flicker noise also goes up by a factor of 2. Uh, so that's a simple procedure for any differential circuit. Okay, uh, now let's go ahead and uh, look at some basic principles that we need to follow. Uh, we know that the total noise of a circuit trades with power consumption, as we have seen a few times in the past. It trades with the bandwidth, because remember that the spectra that we have found show the amount of noise per unit bandwidth. In reality, the signal occupies a much broader bandwidth, so we have to integrate the spectrum of noise, the output noise, the input noise, whatever we need, uh, across the entire signal band. In fact, uh, from not just the signal band, but from zero to infinity. So uh, all of that noise matters, and if we want to accommodate a faster signal, meaning 
uh, accommodated a wider bandwidth for the signal, then we also uh, let in more noise, so the noise performance gets worse. And that's a trade-off between the noise and the bandwidth. By noise, in this case, we mean the total noise. And uh, there's also a trade-off with linearity. I'll give you an example shortly. <clears throat> Generally, we want to avoid source followers in low-noise design because, as we saw, they provide no voltage gain. And uh, also, generally it's a good idea to remember that if we have lots of devices in the signal path without much gain, then the noise performance will probably be not very good. So let me show you a couple of examples to drive these points home. Well, uh, consider a simple differential pair with degeneration. The use of degeneration is primarily for improving the linearity of the circuit. But as soon as we place this resistor here, we have to deal with thermal noise. And interestingly, not only that, now that the tail currents have been separated into two on the two sides, if we do it this way, then some of the noise of these current sources also appears as a differential component. So the noise of these two current sources also matters. So that's one example of trying to linearize the circuit and, uh, as a result, incur a noise penalty. <clears throat> okay, now, we can build a circuit that uh, improves the linearity beyond this degeneration by a more sophisticated feedback network. Here's an example of what we do. So uh, what we see uh, in the, uh, generally uh, across the circuit from the outer circuit is similar to what we have before, a differential pair with degeneration. But then we sense the output voltage by these transistors and we inject a current into the sources of these devices. And it turns out that uh, now the linearity of the circuit improves because you can see that uh, the current through M1 uh, cannot change because this current source is constant. This feedback ensures that the current through M1 cannot change. If the current cannot change, this VGS cannot change, so the circuit is much more linear. Unfortunately, however, now we have M3 and M4 also contributing noise right at the input. You can see that the noise current of M3 and M4 is injected right at these two points, which are the sources of M1 and M2. So this is an example of a circuit that has too many devices in the signal path without voltage gain. Right? So this device injects current here, this device injects current here, and so do these devices. So obviously the noise performance of the circuit will be worse than this one. Okay, let's uh, look at a simple telescopic cascode op-amp and uh, by inspection and from our previous knowledge try to derive its input for noise voltage. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, it's a differential circuit, so that doesn't bother us. We just look at one half. And then we go around and look at each device and determine what kind of device it is, what kind of topology it is. And based on our previous knowledge, we know how much noise to expect. All right, so starting from M1, uh, if we look at the half circuit, so this is AC ground, we see that M1 acts as a common source stage. So it has a certain gate referred noise voltage. Uh, spectrum given by 4kT gamma over GM1. So that has to be here, right? Okay, so that would be 4kT gamma over GM1. Now we have two of these eventually, so that's why it becomes 8. Just like a differential pair. Alright, how about M3? M3 is a cascode device. We decided that the cascode device should contribute negligibly. So M3 doesn't appear in any of these equations. How about M5? M5 is a cascode device for M7. So again, M5 contributes negligibly because if I model the noise of M5 by a gate referred voltage here, I can see that the gain from here to here is small, uh, certainly much smaller than the gain from here to here because this device is heavily degenerated by M7. And finally, M7 itself. M7 is a current source. 
And this current source contributes noise, as we saw before. In fact, for all practical purposes, we can say that uh, this device and this device contribute noise just the way we had this device and this device contribute noise. The difference between this circuit and the telescopic cascode is that we have inserted the cascode PMOS here and the cascode NMOS here. And they don't contribute much noise, so the noise performance should be similar to this. So I'm going to copy this equation over there, but I just have to change my transistor numbers because here I have M3 and M4 as constant current sources, whereas here I have M7 and M8. So I just change these to M7. So this equation is exactly the same as the input different noise voltage of a differential pair with current source loads, except that uh, this no these numbers have to be changed to reflect these current sources. So the first time we see a telescopic cascode op-amp, our reaction should be, don't worry about these four, just focus on these four as far as noise is concerned. So how do we minimize the noise? Well, we want to maximize the GM of these devices. Uh, and we want to minimize the GM of these devices because these are current sources. Uh, so that means that uh, we want to minimize the overdrive of these two transistors, assuming that the current is known. Uh, we want to maximize the overdrive of these two transistors. Because if you remember, GM is inversely proportional to the overdrive voltage for a given current. Okay, so this means that uh, we allocate a larger overdrive to these devices and that means that they tend to consume a significant amount of voltage headroom and that's a problem with this type of topology so we have all of these transistors stacked and these two especially have to consume a lot of headroom okay now in some cases the 1 over F noise of the circuit may not be very good if you remember we said that in many technology nodes the flicker noise of PMOS is quite lower than that of NMOS. So we might decide to change the input transistors to NMOS transistors, which means all of these will change. Uh, sorry, change them to PMOS transistors, so all of these will change. So these will be PMOS, so will these be, uh, and these will be NMOS, if the flicker noise of these two devices is excessive. Okay. Uh, then uh, let's look at the noise in a folded cascode op-amp. Uh, so here we have our differential pair. So we have their gate referred noise voltages, 4 kT gamma over GM. So we have two of those, that's fine. And then we have some cascodes, M5 and M6 are cascodes. So they contribute negligibly. M3 and M4 are cascodes, so they contribute negligibly. Uh, but M9, M10, M7, and M8 are constant current sources, so they contribute noise. For example, if I'm wondering about the, the role of M7, I uh, place a voltage source in a series with this gate to AC ground, this is AC ground, right? <clears throat> Representing its gate referred noise. And I'm asking myself, does this produce significant noise at the output? Well, okay, so let's assume a little step here, see what happens. If there's a step at this gate, above and beyond the bias voltage, uh, then this current changes, and when this current changes, there will be a significant change at the output. As you can see that we have a cascode amplifier from here to here. So yes, indeed, uh, the noise of M7 uh, does contribute to the output. So what's interesting is that in the folded cascode op-amp, we have two four, six contributors, all of which are significant. Whereas in the telescopic cascode op-amp, we had only four contributors, the input devices and the current sources on top. So that's one disadvantage of folded cascode over telescopic cascode. Okay, so that equation comes out to be like this. We have uh, the gauge of noise of M1 and M2, and then we have the noise current of these two refer to the input by dividing them by gm1 to squared, as, I, as we saw before. And similarly, 
the noise of these divided by the same factor g m1 squared. And that's how we obtain the overall thermal noise of the circuit. Uh, so as I said before, if the flicker noise is objectionable, we can uh, completely change everything to the other uh, type of transistor so that the inputs are PMOS devices and that would have lower flicker noise. All right, so what we see in this design is that uh, to minimize the noise, we have to uh, minimize the overdrive voltage of M1 and M2, so they have to be wide transistors. And then we have to maximize the overdrive voltage of voltages of M9, M10, M7, and M8, because these are constant current sources. And that means that they will take up a lot of headroom. So these two will need some voltage headroom here, some minimum VDS, and similarly these two. Uh, if the noise is objectionable. So those are the trade-offs that we see in designing a folded cascode op. We have six transistors to focus on, and we have to choose the overdrive voltages so that they give us the right amount of input-deferred noise, as we see here. Okay. Uh, in general, today, we often have to design our op-amps as two-stage op-amps because uh, the folded cascode uh, or the telescopic cascode either do not provide the right amount of swings or they just don't have enough gain. So depending on the situation, we may have to resort to a two-stage op-amp. Shown here is a very simple two-stage op-amp uh, with no cascoding. And what we see is that uh, if the gain from the input to the output of the first stage is large enough, let's say 5 or 10, then we can say with good confidence that the noise of the second stage is negligible, as is referred to the input of the first stage. So usually that's the case. It has to be the case. Um, so really what we have are four transistors contributing noise, these two and these two. Now, you can see that the VDS of M4 is actually quite large. Why? Because it's the VGS of M6. So that means that the overdrive of these transistors can be chosen large, which means their noise can be also minimized. So if we are lucky enough, uh, the noise of the circuit can be uh, determined by only the noise of M1 and M2. With some, uh, some contribution by M3 and M4, and even a smaller contribution by the second stage devices. So that's the upshot of this topology. Of course, the gain of the, the overall gain is not that much, right? So the gain from here to here might be five. The gain from here to here might be five. So that's the amount of gain we can get. Okay. Uh, so this is the uh, perhaps the lowest noise we can ever get for a moderate gain uh, in any given circuit in any circuit topology any differential circuit topology. On the other hand, if we add some cascodes to increase the gain, the story changes a little bit. So here I have added cascodes to the first stage to increase the gain of the first stage. Uh, so that's fine, but now we have less flexibility in choosing the overdrive voltages of these current sources because uh, the supply voltage has to accommodate uh, all of these transistors. So because we have added cascodes here and cascodes here, we inevitably lose some overdrive voltage that we could give to M7 and M8. So the contribution of these current sources now is not negligible. So that's a disadvantage of this topology over the simple two-stage op-amp we saw in the previous slide. But of course sometimes this is necessary because we're trying to get a high gain. All right, so in this case, we have four main contributors. And hopefully, uh, well, certainly the gain of the next stage is negligible because the voltage gain from here to here is quite high, right? So it's just four contributors that we have to manage. All right, so based on these observations, we can uh, come up with a very simple and basic design procedure to obtain a first order design that can be later polished and refined to give us the ultimate design that we're looking for. 
Okay, so uh, we always start designing op amps, in fact, most circuits, with a given power budget. That's a, a very good way of starting the design because it gives us a more, a more methodical approach. Even if the power budget changes later, we can come back and repeat the design process. Okay, so from the power budget and the supply of voltage, we have a certain amount of bias current available. And typically, as a first order approximation, we allow half of the power to be spent in the first stage and the other half in the second stage. So now we know how much current we have through each of these devices. And we go ahead and pick the dimensions of M1 and M2. Uh, we, we pick certain overdrive voltages uh, so that we can fit the whole thing in the supply. But we are mindful that the noise of M7 and M8 may bother us. So we will give smaller overdrives to M1 and M2, M3 and M4, M5 and M6, and a larger overdrive to M7 and M8. So, for example, if VDD is 1 volt, we can give perhaps 100 millivolts to these, 100 millivolts to these, and then maybe 200, 300 millivolts to these, and another maybe 100 millivolts there, something like that. So uh, we can try to make a more intelligent choice of overdrives, knowing that M7 and M8 will contribute significant noise. Okay, uh, once we have the overdrives and the bias currents, we can find W over L of all of these transistors. And generally we start with the minimum L that the technology gives, unless the minimum L simply doesn't give us the gain that we are looking for. And then we can simulate and see the input effort noise and see if it's acceptable. If it's not acceptable, we can play with the overdrives a little more, we can make these devices wider perhaps, uh, but uh, our hands are really tied. We might have to trade noise, uh, uh, power consumption for noise. So we have to ask for a higher power budget in that case. All right, and again, if the flicker noise of M1 and M2 is problematic, we might have to change everything to a PMOS input and probably very large input transistors. Okay, uh, let's switch gears to KT over C noise because this is also a critical component in many of today's circuits. And we need to have a pretty good understanding of it and see how we go about incorporating its effect uh, in our circuits. So remember that in one of the lectures we calculated the output spectrum of this simple low-pass filter due to the noise of this resistor. And we saw that uh, it had this shape with a spectral density of 4 KTR at low frequencies. And then we saw that the area under this can be calculated to be KT over C. That's the total noise power coming out of the circuit. And it's independent of R. So whether R is small or large, this area is the same. Okay, so now let's go ahead and assume that this resistor is actually switched into the output periodically. So in a sense, we are building a sampling circuit. And in fact, in a sampling circuit, we don't necessarily have an explicit resistor, it's just that the switch itself has some resistance. And resistance could be low or high, but it doesn't really matter, right? Because we saw that here. So now if we go ahead and take this resistor and switch this resistor to the output periodically, while this resistor produces noise all the time, what we see is that uh, sometimes we have noise when the resistor is connected to the output. And then the output is frozen when the switch is off. So we have some noise variation at the output, and then the switch turns off, and we freeze the instantaneous value of the noise on the capacitor for a while in the hold mode. And then we turn on the switch again, so the output becomes noisy and the noise varies, and the switch turns off, we freeze the noise at the output, and so on. Now, in most applications, we are interested in the amount of noise that the circuit produces only in the hold mode, meaning when the switch is off. So we are interested in spectrum, or I should say the total power, associated with these frozen values. 
These are also noise components, but they're frozen for half of the clock cycle. Now it turns out that if you do that calculation, uh, the overall noise power associated with these frozen values is also close to K2 over C. So we say that if you have a capacitor and there's a switch connected to here, when that switch turns off, the resistor that is inside the switch or is outside the switch, doesn't matter where, what, how much it is, deposits a certain amount of thermal noise on the capacitor, like so, whose total power is given by K2 over C. That's inevitable. So any switched capacitor in any circuit will sustain a noise given by K2 over C. Uh, if you want to have a feel for numbers, with a one picofarad capacitor, the RMS noise voltage will be 64.3 microvolts. So that's one way to calculate that. All right, so let me show you one example of how K2 over C noise uh, comes into the picture and how it affects the design process. I would like to show you a circuit which we call a multiplied by two stage. It's a circuit that can amplify a given voltage by a factor of two, and that factor of two is quite precise. So imagine that we have two capacitors, we assume they are equal, uh, and their left plates are connected to the input, and their right plates are connected to a unity gain buffer. So what happens here? Well, node X is kept at zero by the amplifier. That's a virtual ground. And then the left plates of C1 and C2 are following V in. So as V in goes up and down, the voltage across C1 and C2 is also going up and down. So C1 and C2 are sampling V in. Now, at some point, we decide that the sampling is finished. We want to freeze the voltage on C1 and C2. So, we have some switches here that turn off and disconnect the left plates of C1 and C2 from V in. Okay, so C1 and C2 both have stored the instantaneous value of V in on them. And the next step, we flip C1 around the op amp while this wire is broken and we flip the left plate of C2 to ground. So, here's the picture. The left plate of C2 is grounded, the left plate of C1 goes around the op amp, and that unity gain feedback is removed. So now what happens? Well, we see that C2 has zero on this side, and eventually zero on this side, because this feedback guarantees that node X is a virtual ground. So even though C2 had absorbed charge from V in, now it has lost it. It had lost it through this virtual ground to C1. So now C1 holds its own voltage, which inherited from V in, and the voltage resulting from C2, the charge that came from C2. So C1 holds a voltage equal to two times the sampled value. And because C1 is connected between X and the output of the op amp, the output of the op amp will also have a voltage equal to twice the input voltage that we sampled. So this circuit samples the input voltage and by the switching action creates a copy of it at the output that has twice the value. So we say this is a multiply by two stage. It takes a voltage, multiplies it by two. And that multiplication by two is quite precise. So this has application in many different designs, in particular in analog to digital converters. Okay, so let me show you the actual circuit that allows all of these switchings to happen. You can see that we have C1 and C2 with two switches here. So in, the, in this mode, S3 is on, so we are in unigain feedback. S1 and S2 are on, so C1 and C2 are connected to the input, as we saw here. So we are sampling. And then, at some point, we decide that we would like to finish the sampling process and freeze the voltage. So S3 turns off, S1 and S2 turn off, and then S5 turns on, uh, bringing the left plate of C2 to ground, like so, 
And S4 turns on, uh, taking the left plate of C1 to the output, like so. And that's how we perform this multiply by 2 amplification. Okay, so with all these switches going on, we suspect that there should be quite a bit of K2 over C noise. So how does it go? Well, we just have to focus on every mode and understand what happens. In the sampling mode, here's what we have. We have two switches, we can merge them into one. So there's a certain resistance associated with these switches. It doesn't matter how much it is really. And then that resistance has a certain amount of noise. So what we know is that once these switches turn off, they will deposit K2 over C noise on these two capacitors. That's inevitable, right? Okay, any other source of noise here? Well, the op amp is placed in unit gain feedback, and the op amp itself has noise. We've saw, we saw how we can calculate the input referred noise of an op amp. And because this node tracks this node, this node has the same noise voltage as this node. So the input referred noise voltage of the op amp also appears right on the right plate of C1 and C2. So at the moment that this switch, turns, uh, this switch turns off and these switches turn off, we have K2 over C noise coming from the left onto C1 and C2. And then we also have the noise of the op amp on the right hand side. So C1 and C2 inherit K2 over C noise and the noise of the op amp as we exit the sampling mode and we enter the amplification mode. And how about the amplification mode? Well, in the amplification mode, we also have a bunch of things going on, right? So we still have a resistor, uh, a switch resistance, uh, this one, in series with C2, as shown here, RSW5. So this produces noise, and the first order, we can say this is K2 over C noise, right? If you integrate this, this is a simple RC circuit, like what we saw before, even without switching. And that produces K2 over C noise here. Okay, uh, similarly, there's a resistance here associated with SW1, uh, sorry, SW4, which is this one, and that noise uh, acts like K2 over C noise. And then finally, the op amp noise itself is sitting here, in this case, uh, producing noise at this point, which gets amplified and comes out. So all of these noise sources have to be taken into account. So you can see that a circuit as simple as this presents many interesting challenges just in terms of analyzing the effect of noise and of course eventually in terms of minimizing it. For KT over C noise, the only solution is to increase the size of the capacitors. And you can see that when we do that, in this mode, the preceding circuit sees a lot of capacitance. And in this mode, the op amp sees a lot of capacitance. So we have a trade-off with speed and power consumption and everything else. And of course the noise of the op amp itself has to be minimized. This concludes our lecture series on noise. I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture series. Thank you and goodbye.